All right, I'm going to get started. I'm afraid this is a very packed uh, presentation. So there's a lot of material here. There's also a workshop that's, this is sort of more high level architecture stuff. And then the workshop is going to go into the nuts and bolts. Okay. So I'm going to be rushing some things. Um, in, and then later on, we'll, we'll have more details. There'll be time for questions after. So I'm going to try and do this. And we have 15 minutes Q&A at the end. OK, so there's a lot of history uh, behind people showing up and wanting to do P4 in the kernel over the years. Many informal discussions of the hallways. Then we had formal discussions. Initially, they used to show in TC workshops. We had one, I think, which was specific for P4 in the kernel, which happened in Santa Clara Intel. Alex, I think you, I remember you being there. I don't remember who else was here that attended. Anybody else attended that workshop? Yeah, David was there. Uh, so lots of discussions, some really good talks. My favorite probably is this one here from Prague in 2019. Lots of discussions, no action. Then in uh, 2020, uh, Nick McEwen gave a talk at it was, it was a keynote in, I like to call that the call to arms. And finally, in 2022, we started, OK, we got to move, and we started writing code. OK? So this project is currently funded by Intel. The goal is to build up on what P4 provides as an ecosystem and to grow, uh, but to grow network programmability in general. It's absolutely not an Intel-only project. It's open source. All vendors are welcome, as you'll see in the workshop there more than, there's more than one vendor engaged in this anybody can participate in coding I'm not sure we're looking for spell checkers yet actually i don't think we need spell checkers don't we run check patch and all that good stuff whenever a commit makes it in so there'll be no room for catching any spelling mistakes i'm afraid and like i said there is a workshop in the afternoon and we do have periodic calls like zoom calls they, Last few times, it's been every two weeks, but we have probably have one every month. Okay, So what is P4TC? Well, it's a scriptable uh, software hardware of uh, P4 match action tables and associated control. So a core requirement is to be able to just basically offload P4. That's the primary goal. But we want to use the kernel infrastructure as opposed to using uh, vendor-specific APIs that are off the kernel. That's, that's the state of art at the moment. All right. Coupled with that requirement is the ability to script the kernel. But, uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. Uh, with that being said, for TC uh, approach, am I wearing this correctly? Put it on the desk, OK. With that being said, basically, the, the P4 uh, TC uh, goal is to go beyond what traditional P4 does. Uh, so it doesn't have to be P4 because we can do a lot more in the kernel and in TC in general than what P4 offers. Maybe someone close that door. Uh, but our initial goal is we're going to cover all the semantics of P4. But we leave it open to add a lot of other semantics that may not fit to P4, for which we hope we can carry this back to the P4 people and say, look, here's some good stuff you can implement. Right? Uh, why P4? Well, it has gained industry-wide acceptance. There is actually no other data path language that's reasonable enough out there today in the market. And it's the current, basically, it's the currently the lingua franca for Hardware data paths. You want to define a data path, even if you don't implement it in P4, you describe it in P4. For example, that's a requirement for some of the cloud vendors. Microsoft, for example, Microsoft Azure, with the Dash project. If you want to sell them a NIC, you better be able to describe it using P4. You could implement it differently, but the behavioral model has to be P4. I, I'm not going to name any other uh, cloud vendors, but they do exist that have similar requirements. So P4 is becoming important enough that we can't ignore it. There's the emergence of DPUs and IPUs. Uh, Moore's law is done. That's my take on it. You can't keep up with I.O. I mean, I think the, there's some stat I saw from the PCI SIG which says you know, I.O. is growing at, what, uh, at least three to four times faster than 
compute. Uh, so you need, we need offload. Offload is needed. Software alone just doesn't cut it anymore. Okay. Um, and so with that, we think it's time to make it real for the kernel, right? As opposed to, again, these fragmented solutions with, I've got my vendor X DPDK API or some other thing that's not DPDK. Um, do we have a URL for the code? Yeah, we do. Okay. So, <laughs> we do have code and I was supposed to like play drums or do something here, like a dance and then share the code, but send it to me, send me the link. I'll, I'll show it at the end. And so you can download this code today. Today was the, supposed to be the release date. And I was going to do like the crazy dance. Zero. Let's do it live. Damn it. Let's do it live right now. And we release the code, right? But I failed. I'm sorry, uh, but I'll do it at the end. Okay, so I'm going to go through a high level. I know this. How many people know what P4 is here? If you raise your hand. Okay, so probably about 30%. So I'm going to do like a high level view for the Linux people, for my people. Okay, so in P4, you basically have a parser in the beginning. Uh, and you have header declarations. At the bottom, you can see that the packets come in into a parser. How do I stop that? <laughs> okay, there's the link, guys. There is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. I have to. I have to kill signal here because, just in case. Let me just. Sorry. Um, so there is. A packets come in. They get parsed. And then you hit a series of match action tables. There's match actions. Basically, you match something in the header or metadata. Does not have to be a header, it could be metadata. And then you run some actions associated with it. And you go to the next table, you run some header matching, you do some action. It's more complex than this, but I just wanted to show you. So if you're familiar with TC, this is what TC does. You match something, you run actions, you could go back and run some more actions, go to the next prior with continue and run the next table, look up and run action, you remove the header, the, the tunnel header, go back, right? So it's pretty good fit for what TC already did for the last 20 years, right? Uh, and then the important thing that's different is we have this flow control. What this does is it describes, given a P4 program, given a series, a graph of tables and act, match action tables, how does the packet traverse through this graph, right? Uh, so I'm going to go from a very high level. Again, I'm describing it from a Linux perspective. Then I'll dig deeper into uh, how, it, how this will be instantiated in the kernel. So from a Linux perspective, assume that the P4 kernel is already in the kernel, the P4 program, I'm sorry. How would you instantiate that? You would just run the standard TE command, TC filter add, whatever, dev it zero or block 22, either at egress or ingress. Protocol should be any here. This is a, this slides are, you know, could have been done better. You define a priority, and uh, the filter, the new filter is called P4. That's new code we added, and you you say my program name is called my program. So that's a P4 program. I haven't shown how it was created. I'll show it towards the end, right? So that P4 program you see at the top becomes the P4, uh, the TC uh, pipeline in the at the bottom, right? There's the concept of multiple keys that P4 doesn't support. I, I'm going to skip through that. I won't talk about it right now. But the, generally, the idea is if I install the same program on ingress versus egress, I may want to look up, uh, I may want to use the source IP as a lookup in one direction and destination IP as a lookup in the other direction. That's, that's why you have multiple keys. Um, so once, once you've installed your program, the next step is subsequent to that, at runtime, you start adding table entries. This is showing uh, the current uh, command line we have in the code that's, that is, is going public today. Uh, and you basically say the namespace is, looks like a URI or a, a, a Unix path. That you say, I, I want my program, the object is a table, the control block is control one, table four, priority 16, this thing called IP, dest adder, 
which is 10, 10, 10, slash 32. And when that matches, I want it to run mirror to SWP0, switch, assuming it's a switch port, and then you drop the packet. So it looks very similar to how flower would look like, except, you know, there's, there's some new syntax there, right? We're doing all this without changing any kernel uh, code. There's a space for you here, Angel. Right. Um, so we're not making any changes to the kernel. Assume that this program, in fact, we, we made zero kernel changes, basically. Right? And I'm able to execute to create this four table pipeline with a bunch of actions at the end with no changes at all. OK? Uh, It's a P4 program, yes. Okay. Right. So it's a P4 program that has been instantiated in the kernel already. Right. So I, I didn't show how you it was started in the kernel. I'll show that after, because I'm trying to to yeah trying to explain to Linux people, and then I'll describe how we create these things. Right. So this is how you create the action here. So it's a human being that's going to type. Um, I think I may have to hold this. Right. Um, a human being that may will have to type the command to instantiate the program, my program, and then subsequent to that, a human or a control plane will uh, run the commands to create the table entries. So it, it, this shows an example of classical TC. Nothing changed here, right? You have you can have the table in software, hardware. If I say skip software, then it goes to the to the hardware. If I say skip hardware, it only updates the, the software version. I can attach them to chains, priorities. Nothing changes there, right? Uh, the one cool thing we have, this is part of that scriptability approach, is when I add a command like that, when I'm updating table, a table called my table, because that's what I called it in my P4 program, then I can what you realize is from here on, this is very specific to my table's key, right? So unlike U32 where you had to type things in hexadecimal, there's actually a human-friendly way to type IP destination address 10, 10, 10, slash 24, and that's achieved through this thing called introspection. There'll be a little demo of this at the workshop at 3.30. Uh, and what this does is this, we do not make any changes to IP route two. Yes, there'll be upstream co code initially, but the P4 compiler or a human being could type a JSON description uh, using a very specific uh, language that's uh, congruent to what the compile P4 compiler will output. And it basically queries that, allows you as a human being to, 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 to make sense of this, but it gets sent over Netlink as a binary uh, key. Uh, in this case, it would be a 32-bit with a 32-bit uh, uh, prefix. Goes over Netlink. We do have validation templates in the kernel, which will say, well, does my program even exist? Does my table instance exist? Does this guy is asking for me to send it to hardware directly? Because of skip software, if you're familiar with TC syntax, that's how we say send this to hardware by just it's a Boolean flag. Uh, yeah, it, the, we are allowed to send to 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 hardware. Are uh, the specified actions supported? Is drop supported by this table? Yes. Did we exceed our resource limit? This is something we're trying to work on. Typically, you don't find out about resource limitations until you go all the way to the driver, or sometimes all the way to the hardware and then get rejected, right? But we maintain state. So we can check it's still in enough space in hardware or not. And then we would consult. If it says skip hardware, then we'll only update this table. If it says skip software, then we go all the way to the driver, invoke the equivalent of TC callbacks. But now for P4, we're, we're going to discuss this at the workshop, if you show up. And if it's hardware bound, of course, the driver will then send it all the way down. And nothing changed. This is how TC works, right? What I'm describing is how Flower would work today. We're just saying this. There's some differences in the sense that in Flower, I would have had to, read, to write a new IP route to code just to parse PPoE. <laughs> okay, and then I'll have to write a new kernel code 
to parse PPOU with the flow dissector, and then I'll have to write some flower code to look at flow dissector. None of that is needed anymore. Right. So, question. That right. Can someone pass Alistair the mic? Because there are remote people here. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll have to repeat your question. Okay. So, so that hardware down there has to be P4 enabled? Not necessarily P4. I mean, you can, you can, like I said, what we are providing is an abstraction for P4. If you have P4 enabled, you, you're looking good, really good. But if you don't have to be for P4 enabled, if you can, you can uh, provide that semantic behavioral model of what P4 needs. Right? So if you just have a smart nick down there, you'll make sure that that smart nick figures it out. So smart nicks is the main one big target about this, for this, right? Okay. Right. All right. So um, there's a small difference in, in in how we would do it in Linux and TC. I can have month many P4 programs, right? And TC is capable of one P4 program injecting into another P4 program. For example, I can go from one, from egress of it zero, same problem we're just discussing, to an egress of it ten, right? And at, but the hooks are still the same as TC, right? They, in, the, in the sense that we have an ingress hook, par, port, in that case, a net dev, or group of ports if you're using TC blocks. Um, and then, of course, you could go to the network stack or you could totally bypass the network stack, right? So the difference is we have multiple of these programs in P4, and uh, in typical hardware, you have one monolithic piece of, of program. Here, we can, we, this is software. We can do whatever we want. So, if there's no questions, I'll go to the motivations and uh, goals. Mike, can some, uh, uh, so go ahead and I'll repeat your question. Looks like uh, PSA architecture of the P4, or do you support any other architecture? We like plan to PNA? Actually, PNA is our first target, Anjali, right? And then we are going to support, we support both. We want to be agnostic to the architecture. So the compiler will tell us whether to output in PSA or PNA, and TC, can, TC is a superset of all those. All right, answer your question? Okay. Actually, the, I'm probably leading to that. Uh, goals are uh, entirely offloading a P4 to a P4 capable hardware using Skip software. And if there's no hardware that's capable of P4, you can entirely run the whole thing in software alone, in the kernel infra, you can run it in a VM, bare metal, you know, you don't, you, skip software doesn't work there. So everything just runs on your VM. And the most important requirement we have is to have functional equivalence. So if I'm going to run a P4 program in hardware versus in software, yeah, it's going to be slower in software, but if I put in X, I get Y. If I put in X in hardware, I get out Y. It's, that functional equivalence is a very high priority requirement. Perform if we had to choose between performance and had functional equivalence, we choose functional equivalence, right? Uh, we believe we can optimize as time goes on, but our first uh, goal is to have functional equivalence and then there's a lot of optimization opportunities that we can add in software. I'm oh, sorry, I, I didn't finish that. Um, independence of changing any kernel or user space code, Right, which is what we call scriptability, um, and for free, this is magical for some P4 people. But for free, what you get is partitioning of your pipeline. You could have some of it in hardware, some of it in software. You could split tables in hardware, tables in software. You get you get that for free, not by virtue of any magic, because that's how TC works. Right? If I have Flower, I can put some things in hardware and some things in software. I can have a P4 program, half in hardware, half in software, right? It's just the pipeline continues, basically. I sh packets show up on chain five, few, right? And they continue working. Right? Uh, my, half my code is in, in, in software, if it makes sense, right? So you basically can have split data paths. Okay, so why is, what is scriptability? Who knows what U32 is? I know you do, Alex. Right, okay, so think U32, okay, and then think pedit, right? Those, 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 those are just generic, so U32 is parse and, and match on any arbitrary packet, right? So there's prior art basically to what we're doing with zero kernel or user space change. The last time U32 change was about 
2014, I think. That, that's the last feature that was added to U32. It's been around prior to that for at least 10 years. And uh, I think the feature was added for XGBE by FastaBend, if I remember correctly, to offload. Right? That was the last feature that was ever added. Of course, there are bug fixes, right? But, uh, but no features. You can arbitrarily pass any header you want. You can describe it using a hexadecimal and bit uh, uh, operations and say what to be extracted and how it's to be matched, right? And if you think of pedit, yes, you can edit arbitrary headers. What you couldn't do with pedit is add tunnel headers or remove tunnel headers, right? Which we will support. So what we did is we looked at this. We don't want to make changes to these. So we created some new, we basically borrowed these and that we're doing that. And think of TCB, SK, TC SKB edit, which I think you wrote. Uh, but it's very limited. It's whatever, the, where I want to add a new metadata. I have to go and edit the kernel. I have to go and edit user space. We're going to allow uh, provisioning of this metadata, what I want, and you know, and I can define my own metadata that doesn't even exist in the kernel, which we call user metadata, right? So all of these are designed from day one. Uh, and that, that's what, in, in a nutshell, that's what we do, we're doing with P4TC, right? With the goal of, with the earlier goals I described to meet the requirements. Okay, so why scriptability, okay? Uh, the strategy of kernel, kernel offloads, the process just takes too long, okay? There's a lot of cost factors, okay? Dealing with upstream requires you hire skilled people in both social and technical skills, not just technical skills, you have to be socially apt. That's not cheap. It takes one to four years to upstream a patch from, to extend flower, maybe if you're lucky, a few months. But uh, th this is one of the reasons I've been told, and people can tell me differently here, that has kind of slowed, why SwitchDev, for example, had a hard time going up, uh, being used, because people want to add features, they are, everybody has their own network feature, and then you have to upstream, and you have to spend three years before it shows up in Red Hat 9.4, and then you deal with Red Hat for support. They, people want support, right? Um, you can speed it up, you can pay Red Hat, maybe a six, seven digit, I don't know what the numbers are, I'm just making up some numbers here, right? And they will do an NRE for you and it will show up in Red Hat 9.4 sooner than later, even if it's not proper upstream. Uh, so, so it's a cost factor basically. That, that's, I would say that's the tragedy of current kind of offers and we're trying to overcome that. We don't wanna have someone who wants, I have a, a very funky uh, op, uh, application, really stupid, I'm gonna show it at the end. It does in network calculation. So you send it to, you, you build your own packet header and you send it to operands and an operation and it's gonna do the math for you, right? So you, the moment you hit enter, it's gonna send it to the network. Somebody is gonna take, pass the uh, one operand one, operand two, operator and then add the numbers or run whatever the operation is and put the results and send them back to you. Now that's a crazy operation, but it makes the sense. Now imagine how long it will take you to push something like that upstream. First of all, everybody's gonna call you an idiot because who needs this? What's the use case? I, I don't care what my, it's my use case. I, I wanna use it for myself. So we, we're gonna isolate those people to, to do their own thing. Uh, the other thing is because every network is different, this whole concept of I'm a box vendor, I'm gonna sell you a black box and you're gonna find some way to whack this into your network, right? This connector cable over here is gonna be called a router. And every network is different from the next one, right? If you go to Meta versus Google versus Azure, they have a very different data path. And, and this is true across many places. So the, the, I think we're seeing a transition now to a phase where people should be allowed, with, the, with enough skills, people should be allowed to define their own data path. And they're already doing that. The other thing that we have seen is a cultural problem that, you know, if I was to add a feature in the kernel by compiling a kernel module or eBPF, some data centers just would not allow you to do that, right? 
However, they have no problem with you. They have one neck to strangle, which is red hat or canonical. Sorry, canonical people. I keep mentioning red hat, but the bash script is allowed. You just sit there. Okay, so does it work on red hat 94? Yes. Okay, let's go. But if you want to compile a module to add a kernel feature, it you have to go through a very long process, right? There's some guy that's sitting there that's his role is just to stop you from doing that. And, and they claim they do validation. Okay, they, oh, it took us a year to validate this. And some of that is bullshit, but it's someone's job. I mean, if you go to telcos, they do exactly this. Okay. So, um, like I was saying before, that if you uh, input X on software equals to input Y, there's a simple rule in, in Linux that if you have a hardware offload feature, you must create a uh, a software equivalent. So that's what this is showing. And uh, the advantage of this is, of course, you can go and run your P4 program, test it on software, and then when the need comes, you basically offload it, right? Uh, meaning you can, you can actually build a whole network. By digital twin, I mean you can build a whole network that's just running P4, test it in your laptop, maybe in, your, in a smaller data center, maybe in a rack of machines, and when you're ready, you just say, okay, I'm going to rewrite my policies to offload, whatever, however much you want to offload, right? So there the are benefits to the kernel rule, where, which says you, you, sh you always should have a software twin. Whatever to be offloaded, better be able to work in software on its own, right? And while we are targeting the P4 developer here, we do not stop a Linux sysadmin, whether with a gray beard or not, and balding head, to go and write a script that instantiates a program in the kernel. Right. So the kernel, the, the P4 program is actually instantiated inside the kernel as a script. Right. So we have some infrastructure code in the kernel. You run your script. Now your program is available. Then you go and start populating the policies you want. So the Linux op guy is still very important. They, we hope there'll be, there'll be innovation out of that that will be fed back to the P4 community. Um, so again, like I said before, we are targeting P4, uh, but we will go beyond P4 with the idea that, so if, as long as you can behaviorally describe things with the P4 constructs, you're good to go. So the co-design principle is that we have what we call template-driven architecture. So the way you define your program is through these things we call templates, which are generated by the compiler. A human being can generate ones, but when it gets very complex, probably very tricky for you to hand code one of these. All right. So you basically, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about this. Um, so, but you create you take the P4 program is mapped to mechanisms in the kernel. Uh, and these template scripts basically, once they're put in the kernel, you basically have the data path of your choice. Right? I'm, I'm going to go into, like, I, and again, I should reiterate that there is uh, prior, prior to this with U32, P edit, SKB edit, limited SKB edit, but the, the, the concept is the same. We're dealing with metadata, headers, Etc. Um, and the design goal to answer your question is we do not want to be just uh, specific to one P4 architecture. We're P4 architecture independent, PSA or PNA. Uh, we want to support multi-vendor. Anybody who wants to do P4 or emulate P4, we want to support regardless of the NIC. We want to add debuggability from day one. Uh, is developer and operator runtime troubleshooting? Admission control is an is an goal we have. It could be tricky in some cases. Uh, basically, when you write your template, you describe your resource constraints as well. As well, uh, the kernel keep state of in at a runtime, the kernel keep states of in use resources, and we are from day one. Not as an afterthought, designing a very efficient CRUD netlink messages. So it's not gRPC. This is CRUD, create, read, update, delete, semantics to the kernel for uh, hardware objects or software objects. 
uh, lower latency for single uh, transactions, something like Kubernetes may benefit from that, but very high throughput for batching. Right. Um, any questions before I jump to how we create these P4 programs and put them in the kernel? Okay, if there's no questions, I'll proceed. So I just want to recap that I showed earlier on that we had a P4 program, which was then installed in the kernel this way. And then subsequent to that, we were just busy updating tables, right? You select your table of choice on your program of choice and you define the match and the actions, right? And this is how a P4 program gets created. You basically write a P4 program in the usual semantics of P4. Uh, you then feed it with the target constraints. The P4 compiler uh, front end generates, uh, has a TC back end which generates, uh, although I'm showing this as uh, four different files, but these are, these are uh, parser. There's, there's one which teaches the parser how to parse packets. There's one that if the P4 program had metadata, it will describe the metadata. It doesn't have to be kernel metadata. It could be uh, user, your own defined metadata. There's one which describes how these things are connected. And there's one which describes actions that are either in the kernel or you could also create new kernel uh, actions. So you compile, you build your P4 program, you execute these this files you, as bash scripts, and voila, you have your kernel program in there, which runs, uh, which runs um, your P4, which is equivalent to your P4 program. Alternative, uh, in addition, if you're doing hardware offload, this software kernel P4 program is equivalent to what's in your hardware. I'm not showing this part because we're still under discussion on how we're going to load things here. In the workshop, there'll be more discussions. Question? No, so the question is, I'm going to repeat because he didn't have the mic. Compile, is the compiler part of the kernel? No. The compiler is a separate tool set. Its job is, so the compiler for TC is pretty straightforward. It will require, if you're going to be hardware offloading, a target constraint which is something we're still discussing, actually, correct? Right. This is still under discussions, okay? Uh, let me repeat that question. Oh, someone give him a mic, please. Right. Repeat that question. So if you have a P4 compatible uh, Outwell, mm -hmm. how, do, how are you going to communicate with Outwell? There'll be new uh, callbacks in NDEV. So you're, you're talking about runtime or how do you load the P4 program in your hardware? Okay, so both, I'll show, I, I did not want to show you how you would load your hardware program because we're still having that discussion, but I'll show a slide of one suggestion, right? And I think at the workshop, there may be other alternative di discussions. We're trying to reach a consensus at some point. Uh, Runtime is what I showed earlier, right? So you, this is how you tell your hardware. You basically use the TC skip software, skip hardware, and your driver better be able to handle it. So it's your problem in your driver. If I told you go and update uh, my table with this key, this priority, and that action, you have to know how to handle that. We'll give you opaque objects. Each of these things has an ID, so you should be able to know how to handle this. So the reason you've got the path semantics in there for the table is because your compiler generates that into a directory with that table from whatever my .p4 file was. It's, it's more of a JSON file, but yes. So J there's some JSON your uh, path semantics. Right, and hopefully you should see some sort of more detail about that in the, the workshop. So, um, this, is, but basically you have a compiler. A compiler takes target constraints, which means your hardware constraints. Is it PSA as well? Maybe that's a command line option. We're still working on this part here. Uh, generates your scripts, you load them. At runtime, you basically start, you load your program using this command. Basically, the templates are a separate semantic. They load it into hardware, and then you say, okay, yeah, I want that my program to run on it zero, egress or ingress. 
right? And then you start loading things on different tables, right? Okay, so next I'm just gonna go and describe for the people now who know a little bit about P4, this may make more sense to you, that there are several objects that we are making available in the kernel. One is the definition of the pipeline, which is how the tables are connected. The other one is the parser, how the parser should parse packets. Header fields, definitions, actions, and action ide identifiers, uh, and, and parameters, tables and keys for those uh, tables, metadata, and extants. Who, who knows what extants are? Good, there's one, two, you don't count. Three, okay, good. So, extends are the trickiest part so far that we've come with, we've come up. Uh, we're introducing three commands in TC. We may end up actually killing this one here and just putting it in here. The first one is to create templates. So you say TC P4 template and you create the different objects. That's how you teach your kernel. And the next one is what we call P4 runtime to add at runtime table objects or uh, policies. And then this is how we instantiate the program, right? I showed this. We may end up combining these two together just because people are already familiar with saying TC filter add or delete, right? Okay, so again, to repeat what I had said earlier, you, these, are the, these are generated by the compiler. Everything in green is compiler generated. Uh, you do it once, you load it into the kernel. You run the scripts and you have a parser, a, provision, a provisioned parser, not no code is being generated here. A, you have a metadata, you have the pipeline description, you have actions. So the green is all instantiation, basically you're loading, you run your TCP4 filter add, you load your program, and then the purple there is runtime. You just, you keep populating your tables, adding, deleting, re reading, all right? And uh, so now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the internals of this. Now for the interesting stuff, okay? So like I said, this is the anatomy of a pipeline. A pipeline has tables. In this case, I have table one to n, but I'm only showing three. A packet comes in optionally. It, you do not need a parser if, you're, if your lookups are based on metadata. But if you are uh, doing a header lookups as a part of your keys, then you will invoke a parser, which in our scenario only tells you where the offsets for the different fields are, because past headers, we don't extract them basically, right? We don't do this deep parsing at the end. Just tell me what the headers are from offset zero of the SKB data. And when I need to read, I'm just gonna go and read that header and use it for something. Um, for, so the, what we are abstracting this as two, two quote-unquote buses. There's a bus which has the headers where you can do read-write operations. For example, if there's an action that's changing a source IP, then it will be writing to a specific header. Uh, but if there's an, uh, the key source IP is needed as a, as a key, then you do a read and you do a table lookup. And there's a metadata bus, right, where you are reading and writing metadata global. It could be global, but or specific to your program. Like SKB Mac would be a global metadata, but uh, if you, my meta will be your own metadata, right? So if, if you look at this picture, the way we did this is we introduced actually actions before tables, before tables, <laughs> before table lookups. So this, there's a hook called the pipeline instance pre-actions. When you write, when that, when that uh, P4 uh, generated a template is done, it actually populates this part here. It says, okay, for this uh, pipeline, uh, based on these conditions, it populates some logic which says, well, okay, you're going to jump to table one based on the current conditions, or, you know, start at table two. That, that, that's a set of actions. We, it's a command line, we, sorry, it's an action we introduced that it, you can teach it to do things, and I'm gonna go into some small detail on that. And then, of course, it iterates the tables, and at the end, there's a pipeline instance post-action. So there's a pre-action for the pipeline and a post-action uh, for the pipeline. And once you're done with that, now, now I'm just going to look into the table. So that I described this part, I described that, now I'm going to describe what's in the table. Uh, so once it, the pipeline selects a table, 
we do we have another hook remember the green is what the template created this hook may be may look at headers may look at metadata and or both um, and then it will most of the time this table instance pre-action just creates a key and anything in purple is something we're going we're upstreaming right so the, this one is upstreamed that is upstreamed so once you construct your key you are now doing masks so we're emulating what a tcam does in software we have something called algorithmic tcam you iterate your masks you create a mask key and you do a lookup this is not very different from flower but in fact we're using our hash table the same way flower does right and you do your table lookup and i'm going to go into a little bit more detail of this because it's an, it's an interesting uh, piece of the code we're, we're pushing and the result of your lookup could be a hit or a miss you pass that uh, result to the table post actions which may look at more headers may look at subsequent uh, may look at read some more metadata maybe write something or other and on a typical scenario this will decide whether you should go to the table two or table three after that and once you're done at the very end after all tables have been iterated like i showed here after after all these guys it shows up at the pipeline post action right uh i guess this looks reasonably clear alistair makes sense okay so here's an algorithmic table uh, here's an algorithmic ticker this is what uh the core engine of what I, what we're showing here this part right part table there's many objects i just don't have time to go through all of them we can talk in the hallways show up at the workshop where we have more detailed discussion and basically what i'm showing here is, as an example is i could have created a key based on by pulling something off the metadata bus and one or more fields that the parser has identified for me so it just tells me this field for example is at offset four and i know it's four bits uh, eight bits i'll read it from there and i'll concat that and now i have a key next i will iterate my mask table no, and not we have different type of masks we have tenary masks like f0 f0 so we, we we're really emulating a tcam right you can do tenary you can do exact matches you can do ranges you can do uh prefix All right, those four are the fundamental uh parts of the p4 lookup so we support all of them so you 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 unfortunately linearly have to iterate all the entries create a mask key then do a lookup using our hash table right and at some at the end of this iteration of all the masks you may end up with more than one entry that matched at that point you look at the priority the lowest value priority is your, is the winner and that's what you use to execute the actions anybody has done this in fpgs yeah so similar idea right the only thing i think will be different is we introduce this salt i'd call it salt which is a mask id okay uh actions is the other object i'm going to de describe and we have the whole week you can catch us at the corner somewhere and we'll we'll, we'll we can discuss it so uh we use tc pre-existing actions if if the p4 program calls for that uh, but you can define your new actions. I wanted to bring this up because this and the algorithmic tickam are very cool places of this. There's a lot more cool things, but those two um, stand out basically, right? So what we did is we observed that a lot of the actions that exist in TC do a, they mostly do read writes of headers or metadata. Uh, if you look at U32 or or, or SKB edit, P edit, they they do. And they do some arithmetic. They could do decrement. P edit already does a lot of arithmetic operations on headers. It can jump based on by reading some offsets to the next header and do some updates. It can do XORs. So all the, all this stuff exists, pre-existing stuff, right? So when, with that, we decided, okay, so we can generalize a lot of what these actions do, what P edit does, or uh, SKB, TC SKB edit. So I'm going to show an example of a P4 program. Here's an here's for the Linux people who haven't seen a P4 program. Here's an action. Here's how you write an action. You see, this action is called IPv4. It takes two parameters. One is called dest adder, which is 48 bits, MAC address basically, and it, another one is a port, which is nine bits. 
And I'm going to write this metadata, which is called standard metadata egress spec. I'm going to assign it the port, which is a parameter. And I am going to swap. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to write the de mark, destination MAC address into the source address. And then this past parameter dest adder, I'm going to put it into my destination address. You're, you're rewriting, you're basically swapping the MAC addresses and rewriting the next hop MAC address. And then I'm going to just decrement the TTL by one. No, it's a very basic thing. It doesn't check some or anything like that, but it serves to make the point. So from the template, I described the template. How do you create the program, right? So we create a template for this action, which is called IPv forward, which happens to be part of my prog. And we describe the parameters. There's two parameters, destination address. One is 40, bit 48, param port type bit nine. And then subsequent to that, we now create the code that matches to this. And you can see there's just a bunch of sets there, right? These are all sets except for this one here. So set this metadata to that param. We have a keyword param, which indicates the parameter. It's param port, param uh, dest adder. And that's it. That's how you write an action, a brand new action that didn't exist before. And you, you, you basically, once you write it, it's now in the kernel. Now you have to prescribe it as part of a match. So you can say now match something which is what the next slide is doing here. Create my program. Now I'm going to create this table entry and I'm going to say action IPv4 dest adder. There's your MAC address. There's your port. Right. We don't use port numbers in TC in, in, in Linux, but uh, we, that could have been a dev it's zero, basically. Um, or you could have created it as an action and then later on used it. So no changes from the semantics of TC, except for the fact that we created a brand new action that didn't exist before we did, right? Externs, a source of portability problems. I believe this is a P4 problem. It has nothing to do with us. Would you agree? Yeah, maybe. You said maybe, okay, we can talk about it after. Uh, for example, right now we're supporting PNA send mirror and send to port. It's a, it's a bit of a challenge, okay? And maybe we'll, if we have time, if the chair allows us time, we will show a small demo of send port and mirror. Uh, we will, our goal is to implement all the specified spec extents. We'll probably add a few Linux kernel helpers and we'll teach the compiler to sort it out. So if you say, I want to generate for P4 PNA, then we'll do all the extents for PNA will be available to you based on what your program needs. And we may not still solve the issues. We don't think this is a problem with TC or the kernel. It's a problem with P4 because extants tend to be very, very vendor specific. So if someone invents their own foobar, we can, as long as it reaches the semantics of P4, we can generate that action. And then unfortunately it's only available for that vendor's hardware and not for anybody else. So you can't write a P4 program using Nvidia card and then using Intel and then using Marvel. It just doesn't work, right? Sorry. Uh, question. Uh, when you say compiler, do you mean a cross compiler? In a... It's the compiler I described earlier for um, for generating the P4 the, the scripts. That one. There is a compiler actually. It's called P4C. Right. But yep. when you take P4 runtime you take P4 code that I already can run right. through a P4 compiler anywhere. Right. right. And you take that I change it to TC bash scripts. Yes. Right. Okay. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to probably zoom through the rest of it. So this is our, we did our Netlink uh, control plane API. You basically, this it's classical Netlink. You basically have a Netlink header, which has CRAD commands, right? You can, you can create, update, delete, get events, subscribe to events. Uh, and then there's part object specific thing. So it defines which pipeline at, when you're dealing with Netlink, you're dealing now numeric values as opposed to names. And then there's more specific paths, right? So for example, uh, when I say, uh, and we can do batching, you can do a single command. So the, the syntax is very simple. You have a verb from the CRUD, a noun, which is, looks like a path and optionally data. So if I'm doing just a get, I don't need the data, but if I'm doing a create or an update, then the data is present. Uh, and if I'm doing a batch, I can put multiple of them together. And we, we are getting some very good numbers on single core right now. 
uh, hundreds of thousands. And we haven't started optimizing anything. This, I'm just giving an intro of something that may be discussed in the, will be discussed in the, in the workshop. That look, this is how TC Flower looks today. Be gone, right? This, all this hard coding, not needed anymore, right? Where you, you basically have, every time you write an action, you have to define an action ID and the attributes and all that. That is going to be defined in, uh, in the JSON file. The driver is going to be cognizant of what we're sending it. Everything has an ID. And the IDs are shared across user space, kernel, all the way to hardware. How you interpret this? Of course, there's challenges. What's in hardware better match what's in software? And we are working on mechanisms for that. It could be SHA-1 keys, etc. Right. And uh, yeah, that's basically what I said, object IDs. Everything has an object ID. This thing is a source of truth. It's generated by the compiler. It's what's in here. It's also what's in there, right? So you don't need to do any uh, hard coding of any sort. I show a simple abstraction of a program. If I have a, a program that looks like that, how the pipeline pre-actions and post-actions would look. You have a hit, you go to the next table, you have a miss, you go there, it's up to your program. And I, this is the funky program I talked about, but I'm not gonna go over details, but imagine you have uh, something like that, that has on F5, it has, um, if there's an operand in F7, an operand in F8, an oper uh, a result that, that is to be written in F9, and F5 has the, uh, the operation. And you basically you write a parser description to parse this. You then have an action that just add, runs the operation, whether it's a plus or minus or multiply, puts it back. It's a cool in-network computing, if you want. <laughs> Question? A kernel already has some implementation before in the XDP. So why don't you use this one? Because it's so, already... Say, say that again, I'm sorry. So uh, kernel already has support for the EDV. I think, I think it's VMware added some uh, compiler from the P4 to EBPF, and it can be loaded so, uh, to... Okay, I thought you were going to say Rust. That... <laughs> so so how, how do you... Uh, you are a hardware guy. How would you do EBPF with hardware? <laughs> I think they have some XDP. It's not hardware. But uh, it's, well, same thing. XDP is not. It, how do you take that and map it to a TCAM? No, there's no any. Okay, so that's that's why. And I, I don't want to have this discussion of a cargo cult, whether it's Rust or EBPF. I'm sorry. I'm just because of lack of time. Okay. So uh, you had this IP slash test adder in example. Right. That that comes from the P4 program, right? So it could yeah. be different, even if it's a so even if I have the same thing on a different architecture, it might be named something different, and yeah. I will have to deal with that. Yeah, we don't care about that. This you you basically your JSON file will have. The... Okay, so you successfully moved the problem to me into FRR. Yes. <laughs> Thank <And> you. you... <laughs> right. So you remember you don't have to. Uh, I'm going to go through one more last slide, and then this is going to be discussed in the workshop for the Linux people to dev link or not. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. And last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge the contributors to this, other than the authors which you saw, Balar and Sosuta are working on the compiler, Namrata, Neha, James, Arif, Satya, Santosh, Sai, Michael Parker, AKA Mouse, Keith, Arvind Kumar, Dan Taliako, and Andy Fingerhat. And I'm done. We can take you now. It's actually official QA, but let's be fair to the people uh, that are online and just pop their questions. I understand these questions, right? Okay. <laughs>